I'm Ross, and we're going to have a look at Matthew 13. What's a parable? That was question three in our discussion. When I answered that, I Googled it and copied down one of the many descriptions. I wrote, a short allegorical story designed to illustrate or teach some truth, religious principle, or a moral lesson. In that definition, I thought the word allegory was helpful because in an allegory, one thing stands for another. We'll get to this in both parables we read this week. An even more interesting question is, why parables? Let's pray before we dive into Matthew 13. Father in heaven, Jesus' parables reveal to us the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So may, so now, may we hear with our ears, see with our eyes, and understand with our hearts this, your life-giving truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's start reading together at verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables. The chapter starts out that same day. <clears throat> what, what had already happened that day? In chapter 12, Jesus had a crowd following. He was doing healings. The Pharisees were attempting to discredit him. And in the last verses of chapter 12, his mothers and brothers went out to grab him because they thought he was out of his mind. That, deal comes, that detail comes from Mark 3, verse 21. People are reacting in all sorts of different ways to his teaching. Pharisees are asking for one more miracle as proof. His family judged him to be out of his mind and had staged an intervention. Sick people had figured out that Jesus heals, and the disciples are not understanding his parables or why he even chooses to speak in parables. Good on his disciples. They asked the question for us in verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? The Greek word for parable means placing one thing alongside another. And while it's true that parables illustrate truth, Jesus surprises us by telling us that his parables conceal truth. When I think about conceal, I'm thinking secret agent, decoder ring. But that's not the sort of concealing we're talking about. This concealing is judgment on those who have already closed their eyes and ears. For those folks, no more truth is getting in. Jesus begins his answer to the why parables in verse 11. He replied, because of the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seen, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. With verse 11 in view, let's notice what each group gets. One, an abundant knowledge and understanding for those who by a miracle of God see and hear. Or a removing of any insight they did have for those who won't see and hear. Jesus quotes Isaiah 6 to them. Now, let me read the last part of that Isaiah 6 quote. For this people, excuse me, for this people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. A parable is meant for heart change, that's repentance, and healing. And that's our principle. A parable is meant for heart change and healing. Parables intend us to hear, see, and get a heart understanding, turn and be healed. These unbelievers have a calloused heart problem. One feels nothing, senses nothing through calluses other than some general pressure. 
The sad thing is what they missed. If they would see here and have not just a head understanding, but a heart understanding, then they would turn, turn to Jesus, that is, turn away, away from their own way in repentance, and Jesus would heal them. <clears throat> Jesus sees us with the eyes of compassion. He longs for us to see, hear, turn, and be healed. But for God's own reasons, only some respond, be among those who turn and are healed. What sort of healing? Many in the crowds got physical healing, praise God. And that's within scope because James 5 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And an echo of that is in Isaiah 6, turn and I would heal them. But what is our greatest sickness that needs a cure? I love this line from an old hymn, be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Why double? It's because it's saving me from eternal judgment then, and it's about a heart softening now. A soft heart is synonymous with good soil. So let's look at soil. <clears throat> the first parable in this week's study is the parable of the sower, and this brings up a memory to me immediately. I got to go to Israel a while, while back, and I'm super grateful to God for that opportunity. On one particular day, our tour bus stopped, and we all piled out and followed a rabbi over to a field. By this time, we were trained to just get started doing whatever it was that he was doing instead of standing around and waiting for instructions. He led us over to an ancient but in-use farm field that had not been planted yet that year. In the field were some prickly weeds and a lot of uh, surfaced rocks. Uh, he started, so we started to clear rocks, and pile them up on the fence line. So when I read this parable, I'm in that field owned by some Palestinian farmer. The hand scattered seed ends up largely in the field, but some have hit hard packed dirt and became instant bird seed. Some landed over a shallow rock and that we missed when we were clearing out the rocks. It would have, it sprouts, but just to be denied a deep root and then it gets scorched. Another seed ended up near the rock pile border where the weeds were well established. Those plants were choked, competing for sun and water. That leaves the last kind of soil, the good stuff. <clears throat> That's tilled soil, soft, as in soft heart, not calloused. What happens to that seed is it replicates itself 100 times, 60 times, 30 times, and that reflects well on the owner. Verses 18 through 23 explain that parable. When we hear these scenarios, we naturally think, about people reacting to Jesus and his gospel. Case one is the fast reject. Look who gets the blame. It's the devil that snatches away what was sown in the heart. There's a true unseen enemy. Case two is hopeful. He receives it with joy. Trouble or persecution comes, and then he quickly falls away. Some of us feel that distress when it describes a family member or a friend. Case three is the one that causes me to slow down and look. This seed is rooted, but gets choked to the point of being unfruitful, as in no fruit. The fruit is the measure of the plant, zero. So what choked him? The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Well, I got both of those. Wealth deceives. It's got a way of convincing you that's, that it's, it is your security, which leaves me little or no thought space left for God's kingdom. And those of us that don't have the false security of wealth, well, the lack of apparent security brings worries that chokes our fruitfulness. What's the antidote to this? It's Jesus. Jesus himself is our security. Many of us have a ready verse that speaks of the security. For example, 
If God is with us, who can be against us? And there's a hundred more of these. The choke out phenomenon is real. It's, it shows up in how we spend our efforts if we're doers, our eyes if we're watchers, and our thought space if we're daydreamers. Are you willing to ask God where he would direct you to notice the weeds that might be choking out your fruitfulness? God prepares the heart, which is the soil. He's willing to honor re your request to be good soil. How do I know that? From chapter 12. Jesus quotes this and says it himself in a sense, a bruised reed he will not break. And speaking of Jesus, a smoldering wick he will not stuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. The way I read this quote from Isaiah is that if you're struggling, Jesus stands at the ready to hear a prayer that puts your hope in him. In these three cases, the seed got snatched, scorched, or choked. In each case, that man will be eternally punished. But the fourth case is joyous, verse 23. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. The last phrase, verse 15, gives us a preview of what that soil prep includes. <clears throat> Turn, I would heal them. Turn is synonymous with repentance. Expect repentance to be part of the soil prep. Jumping back to that day in Israel with our rabbi, I saw him struggling with buried rocks and sharp weeds. Excuse me. <clears throat> he was preparing the soil. Jesus prepares willing hearts for fruitfulness, and that's our principle. Jesus prepares willing hearts for fruitfulness. You might have sensed your rabbi pulling on a, a rock in your heart this week. What would happen if you let him work that one loose and then move on to the next one and then to the next? Take a moment right now to write down one thing. Maybe it's a worry. Maybe, maybe it's about the deceitfulness of wealth that could be choking out your fruitfulness. Write that down. Now, ask Jesus to get that piece of junk out of your field. Ask him to prepare your heart for fruitfulness. Moving on to the parable of the weeds. <clears throat> In this parable, we have a lot of the same crop and farmer elements going on here. We've got the same elements, but they represent different things. So we need to do a mental reset, starting over. In this parable, instead of talking about good soil, it seems to talk more about good seed. So what is good seed? Judy and I, Judy and I have had our struggles with lawns through, through the years. Yeah, I know, that's a first world problem. Judy sent me the store to buy the good seed. <clears throat> well, I read the bag. And here's what I discovered. Both the expensive seed and the cheap seed list the amount of weed seed contained. Oh. This is the practicality of post-Eden life, unavoidable weeds. Well, I bought the good seed. It had the smallest weed fraction. I thought this good seed was only a biblical concept, but there it was right on the Scots bag after two millennia. <clears throat> two millennia. <clears throat> In our Bible parable, a man plants that good seed and the servants spot the weeds. The field owner recognizes, it as, recognizes that as the work of the enemy, but he chooses not to uproot, uproot the weeds to preserve the wheat. So there's a few surprises here, which are also often an element of the parable, a surprise that is. I'm a bit puzzled that an enemy would go to all the work of collecting weed seed and planting it just to harm the owner of course, Jesus explains that he's the one that sowed the good seed and the devil sowed the weeds. 
Another surprise is that the owner does not set his servants to the business of pulling out those weeds. This means that the sons of the kingdom are going to grow along with the sons of the evil one. In my wisdom, I'd much rather not, I'd much rather not grow up next door to the sons of the evil one. Yet, God permitted this situation. Further, he will use it for his glory and our good. <clears throat> both, for both parables, Jesus gives an explanation. In both, but particularly in the parable of the weeds, Jesus' explanation is an expose of an unseen world. So what is visible to us now? Well, if we're sons of the kingdom, we see our true brothers and we see the sons of the devil, but the trouble is, is we're not sure who's who. Who among us wouldn't have written off Saul, now Paul, the persecutor of Christians? But look at what's invisible, what you can't see. He can't see the man who sowed the good seed, Jesus, the enemy who sowed the weeds, the devil, the harvesters who are the angels, and of course, we don't see the two futures that are yet to happen. There's a whole unseen reality. Now, Jesus in his humanity would have seen the physical just like us. But he's also has, he also has an awareness of the unseen reality. To get the parable's meaning, Jesus had to pull back the curtain, showing us the unseen reality. Do I find that scary? He intends that we be aware, unafraid, trusting in him, and relying on him. Now, an element of these parables that we need to notice is judgment. In the first parable, we notice, we notice the snatched, scorched, and choked seed and think, whoa, that could have been me. Humble gratitude is the right response. A phrase that we hear in common speech is, nobody's counting. Well, apparently, God is counting because in this case, fruitfulness is measured 160, 30 times. For believers, there's a judgment that evaluates fruit that lasts through to eternity. In the last verse of chapter 10, um, it speaks of an eternal reward for even the smallest service. And if anyone gives even a cup of, cup of water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly, I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. In the second parable, a punitive judgment is emphasized. That bad seed sowed by the devil, grown into weeds, will be gathered and burnt. And Jesus amplifies on that when he says, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> As I was reading the parable of the weeds, I thought to myself, hey, there's a hymn that mentions sowing wheat and weeds together. I want to mention it here because song lyrics have a way of distilling spiritual truths into concise statements. The hymn, Come Ye Thankful People Come, is full of great stuff, entirely found uh, within this parable. But let me draw your attention to two, 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 two truths. And it's right from the hymn. All the world is God's own field, fruit to praise excuse me, fruit as praise to God we yield. Wheat and tares together sown are to joy or sorrow grown. The wheat and tares together sown, well, that's the surprising basis of the parable. The to, grow, to joy or sorrow grown describes the future of all, serving to either warn or encourage us. And we get it that all the world is God's own field, but a phrase packed with spiritual perception is fruit as praise to God we yield. I'm geeked over that compacted truth. Whatever we, whatever fruit we produce in obedience to God is praise. And it's praise that lasts. What does it mean to the wheat that the weeds remain until judgment? 
we're living in a field with both the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one. The sons of the kingdom will be of great encouragement to us. The sons of the evil one will work to bring out everything unholy in us. Last week, my son Paul and I went to clean up a house of mine <clears throat> after the tenant left. I know the former tenant fairly well, and we even attended church together for a while. Well, my son was angry about the missing sinks and the one wall of missing aluminum siding. I told him that that was peanuts compared to the missing rent payments, but I told him I was not angry. I got into this deal out of obedience to God, and no, and I knew, excuse me, I knew that it would be messy, and now, praise God, that he appears to be close to releasing me from that sticky situation. And no, I don't consider it a loss. I explained the better position the former did now. And I told my son that it was God's business if he chose to bless this guy in spite of his outrageous behavior. I'm not sure that I made it clear to Paul that it was the dude himself that sat me down to rightly lecture me on the necessity of preserving every man's dignity. God assigned that supposedly broken guy to teach this economically empowered guy a godly lesson. I'll likely never know if the guy was wheat or weeds, but I don't need to know. We're not gonna get that kind of invaluable training in a field of all wheat and no weeds. God had stuff to teach me and he used the weeds to do it. I was really pleased when my son caught on and said, what he meant for evil, God meant for good. Those around from last year will remember the words of Joseph, <clears throat> who was second only to Pharaoh. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that verse has its course, corresponding verse in Romans 8, and we know in all things, God works together for the good of those that love him, who have been called according to our purpose. And that's our principle. What the devil sowed for evil, God uses for good. What the devil sowed for evil, God uses for good. People react differently to the gospel. Believers and unbelievers grow together. Jesus gave us those parables because it was gonna help us understand when we're tempted to be stressed over the state of affairs. Some of what we learned this week, we should put into practice right away. Some of what we learned this week might be mystery and beauty to expand our hearts and minds with a view of Jesus Christ. Let's be open to both. When I read parables and really when I read any scripture, sometimes I'm looking for prescriptions, knowing that what, no, excuse me, knowing what pleases and displeases God matters, but the risk is that I'll reduce it to just checking the box, thus skipping the heart work, the soil prep that God intends. I want to end on the mystery and the beauty that is available to us. For many of us here, we want to demonstrate our love for Jesus with our fruitfulness. And what we would expect at this point is an admonition to get busy bearing fruit. But instead, we hear a call to abide. John 15 describes the only way and the guaranteed way to be fruitful. These words contain blessing, assurance, promise, and warning. At the very end, there was what was a surprise to me. It shows that Jesus is not interested in fruit for fruit's sake. He glories in us showing that we are his disciples. In John 15, it's Jesus speaking. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He, the father, cuts off every branch in me, that's Jesus, that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so they'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean, meaning already pruned because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but it must, be, but it must remain in the vine. I am the vine, and you are the branches. 
If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. That's good news. Apart from me, you can't do anything. If you remain in me, you'll be like a branch. If you, if, excuse me, if you don't remain in me, you'll be like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in me and I remain and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, don't miss this. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Should we ask God to search our hearts, prune us, change us, and to help us follow him with real actionable steps? Absolutely. But don't miss that with these parables, Jesus is giving us the secrets of the kingdom of heaven and is asking us to abide. Sometimes I need to check myself that I'm not trying to get the answers for the test, just simply get the answers for the test and reclaim my desire to sit at the feet of the rabbi and have him expand my view and increase my wonder. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your son sows good seed. Prepare the soil of my heart. Prepare the soil of our hearts so that I, that we might be fruitful and bring you glory by showing ourselves to be your true disciples. Fruitfulness comes only from abiding in Jesus. I want to be caught up in your will and purposes and your mystery and beauty. And I'll start by, the list, by listening at Jesus' feet. Along with Jesus, we pray. I praise you, Father, Lord in heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Amen.